Welcome to Series 2 of the Great British Quilter podcast. I'm Sarah Ashford and I can't wait to share with you my fantastic lineup of guests over the next eight episodes. I'll be meeting with authors, quilters, shop owners and industry professionals to find out more about them and how they contribute to the world of quilting that we know and love. A huge thank you goes to Orophil Thread who have generously sponsored this series and helped make it possible. Orophil is an Italian thread company specialising in superior quality cotton threads for professional and domestic quilters. With a wide range of threads in varying weights and a beautiful spectrum of colour, quilters can find the perfect thread for their project. Do visit orophil.com for more information. Today's guest is Lucy Brennan. Lucy is a quilter, pattern designer and blogger and she regularly teaches sewing and quilting classes. She worked for two years as a designer and demonstrator on TV and her projects and articles have featured in popular quilt magazines. Started in 2011, Lucy's blog Charm About You documents her stitching journey, sharing her process and finishes. She also chronicles more personal life events and, of course, the occasional fabric haul. She has photo galleries of her work as well as a variety of tutorials and free patterns available on her website. Inspired by the history and varied techniques of patchwork and quilting, Lucy mixes modern and traditional to create her miscellaneous style. While she hugely enjoys machine sewing and quilting, Lucy is also a very keen hand stitcher and does English paper piecing, hand piecing, cross stitch and embroidery. She actively encourages crafts on social media as one of the three global hosts of the Saturday Night Craft Along on Instagram each week. Lucy's love for crafting has led her to encourage others. She will always share her knowledge to help someone start their own projects, learn a different technique or support their ambitions. Her passions are combining fabric, learning new skills and giving confidence to beginner quilters. The quote, I cannot count my day complete till needle thread and fabric meet definitely applies to Lucy. I've known Lucy for several years now and our first meeting was when she came to stay with me and teach at my guild here in the South West. We're desperately missing our annual catch up at the Festival of Quilts and like so many we've had to rely on Zoom for today's interview. Hi Lucy, how are you? I'm well thanks Sarah, how are you? Oh good thank you, thank you so much for coming and joining me on Zoom. Again we're uh, back to Zoom again. Um, it's lovely to see you on a screen, if not in person. Um, so tell me, how is uh, lockdown for you? We're now in the depths of winter. How are you finding it? Well, thank you for having me. Um, I think this, I've sort of got used to it in a, in a funny way. Um, I think winter can be a hard time for a lot of people I know um, anyway. And this is obviously uh, added to it. And um I think it's you know we're it's a horrible situation for so many people we've all gone through an awful lot in the past uh, sort of year um I'm just very very grateful for having a hobby that keeps me busy and um you know I'm fortunate that I have family and I'm working and all those kind of things so we're just plodding on yeah carrying on taking each day are you managing much sewing right now yeah, I tend to do a lot. Nothing's changed really in that I do tend to do a lot of my sewing at night. You know me, I'm a night owl. So Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to get the kids to bed and then uh, do a bit of sewing and, and odd bits at weekends uh, where I can. We've got a bit more time now. There's there's not so many events. So um, yeah, just fitting it in wherever I can. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say that quilting and sewing is therapy and it's been so important to them throughout lockdown and um, do you find that it's bringing you a sense of comfort during this time yeah definitely I think for me um at, at various points and different stages in my life I found that to be incredibly true that um there is so much mindfulness attached to it um I did a hundred day um 
100 days of silent sewing. I've done that a couple of times. I think I'm going to be doing it again this year. Right. That was a few years ago, wasn't it? I remember. Yeah, I think about three years ago, I did the first one, maybe three or four years ago. Um, and then I repeated it and I've done a couple of different ones since then. But um, I was thinking about what I might, might do for the for the 100 day challenge. And that and that's what I, I think I'm going to go back to that because um, there, there is something so meditative about it and um just that focus you know and it does it lets you clear your mind Mm -hmm. lets you concentrate on something else you know be it the smallest thing a stitch um but it's it's it is incredibly calming and also I think there's some a lot to be said for that sense of accomplishment that comes with some progress on a project a finish on occasion <laughs> you know just brings us a, a nice sense of satisfaction um that you've that you've achieved something in what can be days where you feel like not much has happened so um yeah. it, it definitely uh gives me a lot of comfort in that way and going back to the beginning of your journey how did you learn to sew and quilt um so I, I've always been crafty (laughs) um in that sense I remember being at woodcraft folk when I was very young and I learned black work and that's the first thing I really remember doing um and then child of the 80s lots of friendship bracelets knotting um Ah, thread um and then um in you know high school making hair scrunchies they're, they're coming back I think the hair they, oh they're back yeah, yeah they're they are aren't they I've made some with my daughter with oh my yeah it's nice um is she showing I, inclination I never wear them again and I've worn them so <laughs> 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 and we did I did home ec at school I did do home ec at school so we had we had sewing lessons and we had cook, cookery lessons and I made collots oh lovely yeah, they were. So there is a dressmaker <laughs> in you then, Lucy. <laughs> um, so that, yes, yeah, those are my earliest memories. And then um, about, around about 10 years ago, coming up 10 years ago, my um, cousin visited from California. Um, she's not actually my cousin. It's sort of a generational thing, but she's, you know, we call her cousin. Mm-hmm. Uh, she visited from California, Jackie, and uh, she's a, a long arm quilter. So um we got chatting she brought me loads of supplies and she really encouraged me to start quilting so it's all down to her she gave me the first pattern that I ever did and um also my auntie in York who used to volunteer at the quilt museum in York um, Ah. she's a prolific English paper piecer so she encouraged me to do hand sewing and I held off for a long time because I liked the quick finish of the sewing machines but Mm -hmm. between the two of them they inspired me to take up quilting. Oh that's so interesting I wonder if English paper piecing could be your your project for your um, silent sewing maybe. Well I've got a project in mind so Ah. (laughs) certainly. So how would you describe your style what inspires you? So style is something I have really struggled with, to be honest. Um, I think in particularly um, in the kind of age that we are now with social media and photographs and everything and, um, you know, all the talk of sort of, um, you know, making things pretty for the gram and all that sort of business. um, what What I really struggled with was that I don't, particularly think I have a style I don't have a niche I don't stick to one thing I don't make a lot of things using the same techniques um I don't make a lot of things that um you you know with a particular color palette there isn't really anything I I think of as my particular style so I did wrangle with it um quite a bit and that and I know you and I have actually had conversations about this um in the past as well and um I just came to realize that it's it just is me and um I define it as miscellaneous because it can be 
all things, anything, a bit of this and that, and and I'm okay with that. I if I like it, I'm going to make it that way. And um, I think when I started out, I followed patterns. I used whole fabric collections together, and I was scared to to mix mix things up. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more and more I started to do that, the more I found what I liked. So I don't know what my style is. I just know what I like and the combinations that I like um, together. And, and some- also, I think it's um, something that's constantly evolving. And that's Absolutely. something that you might have liked five years ago might not be something that you gravitate towards as much now. So like you say, your style Um, you know is constantly changing your tastes and it can be an eclectic mix of everything and like you say everything you make it represents you at that moment doesn't it I guess yeah definitely and I like a a whole range of different things I love traditional liberty fabrics you know I absolutely adore those traditional prints but then I love modern quilting fabric and I love slightly ugly colors I'm a huge fan of brown and mustard and that weird greeny yellow color and peach and you know things that haven't been popular for a really long time and I don't particularly like the the older styles of some some fabrics don't appeal to me but if if they're given a modern edge and there are a lot of um you know current designers doing that and um working with browns in a fabulous way so um <laughs> i embrace all those all those kind of things and and i think when when it comes to what I'm, inspires me it is just in the moment it's like you say it's it's whatever i've seen that day or whatever mood i'm in and i kind of create these combinations just based on feeling and um you know, something might have happened to me. I might have just seen something, but it is it is very much spur of the moment. And I think I probably put a lot less thought into it than I should. So what are you working on at the moment? Do you Are you somebody who likes to have lots of projects on the go? Yeah, I definitely am. I think I, I, I can get um, stuck into something and see it all the way through. Um, but apparently from the number of finishes I've been having recently, that's quite rare. And <laughs> I, <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, no, smaller projects, definitely. But the bigger Quick ones yeah. uh, <laughs> sometimes take me more time. So it just depends. If I'm given a deadline, I can work something up quite quickly. But um, uh, generally, I like to have different options because, again, it just might depend what I feel like doing. So if I want to do some cutting even sometimes I'm in the mood to cut some fabric sometimes I want to do chain piecing you know sometimes I just want to sit quietly and stitch so it is nice to be working on different things so you've got those different different options I think if I felt like I had to do EPP all the time I I might find myself getting a bit bored or Mm -hmm. you know I don't know so uh, at the moment the one project I really would like to, to make progress on and get finished is the Manx Log Cabin coverlet that I'm working on. Oh, yes, I've seen that um, Hand sewn. Because mm-hmm. um, I've been working on that for a while, but and I love the process of it. But I want to finish off doing the blocks because I want to get to the bit where you sew it together because I've not done it before. So I'm kind of excited to, to do that for the first time. So um, that's that's sort of my focus uh, quilt even though it's not a quilt technically but that's my focus at the moment and um during lockdown many of us in the industry we've had to get used to being in front of the camera being on zoom um i i personally have been teaching on zoom which has been a whole new experience um but this is something you've been actually doing for a long time um it's not uh, new to you so i just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about your experience of being on tv um how how was it for you so initially, I didn't know I was going to be on TV. Um, I didn't, oh, really? Yeah, no, I had no idea. So I'd never signed up um, to be on television. I just signed up for a project to uh-huh. find out about a project. So that's why I, I didn't assign anything, actually, to be truthful. But, you know, I'd, I'd gone to this meeting to find out about this new project. 
Um, and uh, from there, they explained what it was. And I found myself sitting next to Joe Carter, who is, I consider a very good friend, um, but didn't know at the time. And we were bonded because we were both terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she then she then since told me that she felt like running out of the room <laughs> but when she was sat next to me I just managed to calm her down I don't even remember doing that but I think just us both being a bit fearful was was we were good for each other um so you know I found out what it was and and I was really I was genuinely surprised I had no idea perhaps quite stupidly but I didn't know what was going on so when they explained what the idea was you know I just thought well that sounds really fun and um it was it was really nice I got to do a a sort of a practice show and then there were some delays because of technical things and what have you so we did a few run-throughs before it actually went live but it was live television Mm. um, which kind of is another dimension to it because being on TV is one thing, but not being able to uh, correct it or, you know, make any changes is quite another. Um, So it was terrifying. (laughs) It was absolutely it. Did you get used to it though? Because you did it for a long time in the end. Is it something you got used to being on the camera? Yeah, I did. I think I think it was um, at first I was very probably very stilted and, um, you know, just sort of doing the job. Here's how you do this, you know, demonstrating different projects. And um, I always from the very beginning decided that if it was something I was going to do, I didn't it, want it just to be a Blue Peter sort of a thing. I always wanted to share something useful. So I would always, as I was preparing, think about the tips that I wanted to convey, um, you know, to, so that I could sort of, you know, share some ideas or, or just uh, give a bit of insight um, for people. So um, I saw it as teaching, which I had been teaching before that, and I continued continued to do and, and did all throughout um, so I really saw it as like a teaching uh, opportunity, if you like. Um, and the presenters that I worked with were amazing. The, the first ever show I did um, was with uh, presenter Derek. And he said to me, if you don't know what to do, just look at me and talk to me. And that made it so much easier because then you're just having a conversation with somebody. It wasn't mm-hmm. like I was just there by myself. So I think if I'd, I would have never been a presenter, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I was okay if, you know, doing it as a sort of side them. Yes. That, was, that was fine. Yeah. And my background as well, because I was a sociology lecturer in my uh, pre children days. Oh, really? Do you know, so, I did not know that, Lucy. Oh, did you not? I didn't know. Oh. So um, because I did that for about five years, so speaking to a lecture hall of thousands of, you know, 18 plus year old people um, to being in a studio with a cameraman and a presenter wasn't really it wasn't really all that scary. It was just different. It was different. Because I guess, like you say, when you're in the studio, it's just you and the presenter and the cameraman. It's not a room full of people. So you can almost forget that the camera's there and you're not talking to camera. You were talking to the presenter, weren't you? Absolutely. Exactly. And that's why I do find, you know, Zoom is a bit weird because, you know, if you're talking to a camera, that's, that's a totally different skill from being a teacher and talking to actual people yeah. <laughs> I know there are actual people in zoom but you know what I, mean. I know what you mean <laughs> uh, and I was very honored Lucy because a couple of years ago you made um one of my quilt patterns um on tv you demoed it uh, so that was a very proud moment for me and you demoed it beautifully so thank you for that um but I just wanted to ask you um I'm sure you have a catalog of things that went wrong on tv can you share some of them with us make us laugh yeah, sure I mean thank you and it was an honor to do your pattern because it was a it is a beautiful pattern um and it is a great one it, that was a great one for teaching as well because it's it's such a perfect pattern for people who've never done foundation paper piecing before so um and the hot air balloon design is gorgeous oh so, thank you um it was a pleasure to to be able to teach that so um well demonstrate it I keep saying to you you know um but yeah loads of things went wrong most of it I've probably blocked out of my mind to be honest <laughs> I mean I know I cut myself one day 
Um, I may. Did the viewers know that? Did you did you have to hide it, or did I think you? Think I might have had to. When I start, it started really bleeding. I think I might have <laughs> said, "Could I get a plaster?" Uh, so yeah, I think I did. And I, I mean, that's the thing with you know, it's real life. It's I know it's television, but it's still real life. You're there, yeah. you know, you're just a person, you know, doing a job. So things are bound to happen. Um, a lot of things happened off screen, you know, and there, there was there was a lot of um, you know just things you'd forget something or you know a lot of last minute sort of uh, panics that people never got to see. Yeah. Um, I remember losing my voice. I was really ill one time, so I did a show um, again. I think with Derek, and he was trying to sort of translate. It was an absolute disaster. <laughs> And then I was meant to be doing another show that day and they were like, no, no, you can't. And then I was on the next day and they said, you can't come on if you can't get your voice back. So I went to um, a Chinese takeaway in Birmingham and asked the lady there to give me something to bring my voice back because I, I'm a big believer in, you know, food as healing and all that sort of thing. And she must have, she gave me something with so much garlic in it. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else she put in it, but the next day I had my voice back. So that's amazing, really. Yeah, it yeah really amazing. So um, I was glad to have that to have that happen, um, so I could go to work the, <laughs> the next day. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, we just we had a real laugh. It was really, really you know, I worked with incredible people, uh, John and Natasha and Vicky. You know, the whole team was was just lovely all the production crew were really nice so I think that's the thing about live tv isn't it you kind of do expect things to go wrong and the audience kind of wants it to happen sometimes because it's so funny yeah Yeah. it is just more fun when those when those kind of things happen and um I think that happened a bit more and more as I went on because I felt more comfortable and also I got to know everybody a bit better so um, but then it is, you know, you've still got a job to do. So sometimes that was hard when you really couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to, you know, finish a quilt in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like um, Holly and Phil on this morning, isn't it? They're always in fits of giggles. But oh, yeah. uh, it's really endearing and people love that, you know, you have that relationship. So, uh, yeah, it's great. So moving on from um, TV to social media, and uh, you've been the host of the Saturday Night Craft Along for, for many years now, Lucy. How many years has it been? Do you know, I, don't, I probably should have looked. I'm not actually sure. I think I've been doing it for maybe this is the fifth year, possibly. I don't, I honestly, I'm not sure. The only way I can tell is looking back through my Instagram and it just, I can't, my thumbs hurt from scrolling. Oh, so much, yeah. And I have got the pictures actually, you know, the little um, pictures that we use from each year. So I probably could work it out. Um, but that was started um, by Rachel, the barefoot, uh, sorry, barefoot crafter on Instagram um, and Meg, who is T and, T and Brie on Instagram. And Rachel's in Australia and Meg is in um, America. And I was joining in where I could in their time zones and then thought, why is there not one here? Yeah. You know? um, and I got in touch with them and we, you know, we were chatting and I kind of said, you know, could I be a, a third host? Um, you know, talk amongst yourselves, if that would be okay, it would be lovely to be able to do that. Um, And so then there was a third, there was a third one, which was me. And so the three of us every week on Instagram host the Saturday Night Craft Along. And it's really simple. You just take a picture of whatever you're working on, post it on Instagram, post the hashtag and whoever your host is at that time when you post um, to help spread the word about it um and so we can see pictures as well and um it's just a really lovely community I've had people say they look forward to Saturday nights it's it's you get to see the progress of people's work each week which I really enjoy and it's open to all crafters so it isn't just um sewing or quilting and there's knitters and crocheters and we've had paper crafts um pottery you know anybody that does any any sort of craft is is welcome to join in and I think what's nice is just knowing you're doing something at the same time and obviously when we started it Instagram was um 
in real time. Yes, of course. Yes. And obviously now it isn't. People are just used to the fact that it isn't, but it used to be in real time. So Mm -hmm. you could literally sit and see what everybody was doing. We're all on there at the same time, but we still have that kind of momentum. And if you go click on a hashtag, obviously you can click recent rather than time. Uh, yes, yeah. And if you click recent, you can see all the people that are doing things at the same time as you. So it still has that to, you know, to some extent. Um, and it's yeah. absolutely massive, isn't it? I mean, there's thousands of people joining. Yeah, it's massive now. We've started getting spam and everything. It's oh, really? <laughs> it's almost a thing each week it's like what's it going to be this week you know <laughs> posting a selfie and adding the hashtag because it comes up recommended or something you know oh, it's kind of funny. Fun. um but there's people who have joined in for, for years and so that's really lovely and people don't have to come every week either just join in on a Saturday when they happen to be doing um some crafting but I mean I I never really used to go out that much I mean, you do it religiously because I've said, oh, I'm going out tonight. But it was rare anyway. And now I'm definitely not. So um, I'm always there on a Saturday anyway. Well, isn't it funny how things like that suddenly become even more important in people's lives when we're all locked down? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've had people say they look forward to it even before this. And I think yeah. now it's even more important. And when lockdown first started, I was doing Zooms on for the craft along but um and I had lovely people join in with me um but it wasn't it I just felt like it wasn't massively sustainable and let's face it just sometimes I just want to sit in my pajamas and not do zoom anymore yes. <laughs> um, but I think just knowing there's people there in your phone is lovely you know yes. it's really nice to just check in with people see what they're all doing um and it's it's a nice way to um ask questions for of people as well you know and and get some inspiration and and be part be part of something and and everyone there is so it's so lovely it really is yeah it really is I've joined I join in whenever I'm crafting on a Saturday I'll always pop the hashtag in and see what other people are doing and uh, yeah like feel connected with people it's so yeah good. definitely I think that's what's so nice is it's not it's not just a hashtag that people add to pictures people do go and look at what people are doing on a Saturday night and that's what makes it a bit different I think is you know it is it really is about community and genuinely that's why they started it and that's why I wanted to do it as well Mm, yeah it's fantastic and when you're not quilting Lucy I know you're partial to a bit of cross stitch and embroidery I've seen some lovely work you've been doing recently Um, and now you've um, moved all of your supplies into your nan's beautiful um, wooden sewing box Uh, I loved reading about that on your blog it was really interesting Um, so can you tell us a bit more what are your projects that you're working on at the moment and why are you drawn to those types of projects yeah well thank you um it's it's really it is really special my nan um who I sadly lost last year I'm going to try not to cry uh she was a massive inspiration and a huge part of my life she really was my best friend and my superhero um and she was she did beautiful embroidery she Mm. um had always done really really lovely embroidery I've got tablecloths that she did um and different bits and she was an artist she did a lot of painting as well I mean she wasn't an artist you know but she she was she did painting for fun um and so I've got lots of her sketchbooks and things as well and I had to so I have had her sewing kit for for a while um and you know we did spend evenings together uh, stitching and things so it was really special um and I, I feel like when I'm doing that kind of stitching and any kind of hand work, really, I feel a connection to the women who've gone before me, who have, who have done it. And I, I genuinely feel that deeply. And it might sound a bit woo-woo to some people, um, but it's, it's really special to me. And um it's it's nice to have another craft to do not not just quilting or or sewing but to do some embroidery um a lot I'm doing a lot of cross stitch um 
it's just something different. It's it's nice to have something else to work on. And it is that so slower many pace, pace isn't it? It is sorry, that sir. sorry. It's that slower pace, the cross stitch and the embroidery. It it forces you to slow down and be reflective and feel that sense of connection with your nan and you know, like you said, the people before us. It's yeah, it's a lovely thing to do. It's yeah, something definitely. I enjoy as well, definitely. And I think with cross stitch as well, you've kind of got to concentrate. You really yeah. have to cut. Co- I mean, you really have to concentrate. Cause I've done a lot of unpicking recently. If you're watching TV <laughs> and cross stitch. It's not a good idea. Yeah, no. So I, so it's you know, there's a time and a place for doing it as well, which I think is lovely. And I just, I've just finished a little embroidery that I made into a into a pin cushion. And sometimes it's nice. I've got big projects I'm working on, and it and smaller projects as well. So. I enjoy it for that as well. Um, So I've known you several years now, Lucy. And um, before that, I always read your blog and followed you on social media. And one thing I've noticed about your posts and about you as a person, actually, is that um, you're very uplifting and um, you have a determined positivity shining through. Um, And I saw your recent project, um, The Cushion, and it had this fantastic um, motto it just says on it you're capable um, I really loved that I thought it was I thought it was a wonderful reminder um, and probably something that we all need to hear right now um, so I was just wondering how did that come about why did you decide to go with that as a motto and uh, so that again was at the start of or well, just before the start of lockdown maybe um, I think like a lot of people I'm sure I have periods of self-doubt and um you know worry and um just sort of a a lack of self-belief sometimes and I um in various stages have had you know anxiety and um I had postnatal depression after I had my first child and I had cognitive behavioral therapy. When I had therapy, one of the things that was recommended was listening to music that you enjoy. And I'm in no way suggesting that people just have to listen to a song to feel better. That is not the truth. But in certain certain circumstances, when you're feeling, you know, maybe a bit down, music can be really uplifting. Mm-hmm. And And um, so, you know, when I catch myself in a certain state of mind, that's what I decide to do. I'll listen to music to, um, you know, just take a load off. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I was listening to Gwen Stefani, who I love. Mm -hmm. um, In one of her songs, the line is, life is short, you're capable. And the song is actually all about her, you know, sort of life and that kind of feeling of, you know, can I do this? Should I do this? And um, it was, I think it was about her making her album and then just going, what, you know, what are you waiting for? Just sort of do it. Um, and that's a big motto for me is just do it. Cause a lot of times I, I, you know, I question myself and query myself and then I think just do it. Just, yeah, just get know, on get with it. it yeah. Done. Get on with it and get it done. Yeah. And and sometimes that's not, and it's not easy. I don't say it flippantly. It's no. not easy. Um, but that kind of reminder that we are capable, we are capable, that, you know, we all do so many things in our daily lives, you know, even if it's putting a load of washing on, whatever it is, you know, we are capable of doing things. And I think just that, thinking about things in that way, I am capable, do I want to do it? Am I scared of doing it? Is it going to be any good? They're all different (laughs) questions or things to just put aside sometimes, but just knowing that, that you are capable and you can do it. So I kind of took the inspiration for the font was from uh, Gwen Stefani's um, Love Music, Love Angel Music Baby. I always get it wrong. And Lamb was her um, uh, brand that she created and she used to design clothes and things. So that that kind of style of font was very um, her. So I just sort of thought that was quite cool and the kind of 80s uh, fabric that I used as well. But I think it would look lovely in you know, with different styles of fabrics and things. So I just made it into a pattern. And then I did do an embroidery um, template with the pattern as well, because I just thought that's that would be nice to just add on to something. Or I love I love all this uh, stitching on clothing. 
yes yes really cool so I'd love to see like you're capable on somebody's denim jacket or something. <laughs> yeah that's a really nice idea yeah that would be really fun so yeah I think it's just about you know not giving myself a hard time you know not beating myself up because I don't meet my own expectations that I put on myself and and recognizing that that maybe I can't do everything but I am you do a lot Lucy you definitely do (laughs) (laughs) and the thing I love about that cushion it's so it's so bold and bright and actually very different to some of the cross stitches that you do that are a little bit more traditional or some of your previous work and it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning you know you don't need to pigeonhole yourself into a certain style you know you that's what you wanted to make at that time with those colors and that's what inspired you and then the the cross stitch that gives you something else so it's kind of different sort of aspects of you isn't it through your work yeah absolutely and all the things that come from me I think what you said about um the positivity and everything is just one of the nicest things anybody's ever said to me honestly Sarah I you know I try really hard and um and naturally I am an optimistic person but I have inherited this strange worry and anxiety that's that's built up over over time and I think especially this past year because my nan was a worrier and we used to get on the phone and we'd worry together and then by the end we'd feel much much better about it and yeah. um, so not having someone who worries in the same way I do about the same things has been really hard um but my name it comes from the latin word for light and it means light and I don't know if it's knowing that or I don't know I just have an inherent feeling that things are going to be okay yeah and I and I struggle in in many ways like lots of people do with different things in my life but you know I just through it all I do have positivity and you know there are so many cliches about it and things like that but I think anything that anybody can find that's going to make them feel better that's going to help them to smile that's going to help them you know relax at the end of the day you know all all of those things all of those little things that mindfulness is just so important um and yeah smile (laughs) you're smiling at me now (laughs) the listeners can't see you but you're you're smiling um so thinking about 2021 um that we have just entered into um are you feeling hopeful for 2021 what have you got in the pipeline that you can share with us Um, Yeah, I mean, I think this is the first year. I mean, I always do. I'd like to do a vision board for the year. I like to set up my one little word for the year. I've done it every year for quite some time. Um, And I have done it. I haven't actually put up on my blog yet my word for the year, but I will be doing shortly. Um, But I think I, yeah, you know, the start of the year is always a wonderful thing. And this year is different um I haven't got as many plans as I might ordinarily do because we just don't know really what's coming and and when we're going to be able to do the things that we that we um you know maybe would have uh, liked to plan for so um I'm doing more online teaching so I've got more classes uh crafty monkeys yep. and I have some plans for some orophil projects because I'm an orophil artisan again this year so mm-hmm. I've got some plans for projects um, working with those threads. And then I'm just going to see what happens and go with it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all we can do really, isn't it? And like you say, if, if we make lots of plans, then we just end up disappointed if they're cancelled. So in a way, it's best to be a little bit more open-minded and kind of go with the flow and ease into the year gently, <laughs> I feel, yeah. um, and, and kind of take it each day and week as it comes really. Um, and finally, Lucy, I like to ask my guests to share two top tips with the listeners um, and I know that you've got many tips up your sleeve that you could share with us um, but if you could just narrow it down to two what what would they be? So I, I was thinking about this I do I mean I share tips all the time on my blog and in my classes um, and I think 
with the mood of things the way it is at the moment I wanted to be a bit more general so um my first tip is really to do what you love so to enjoy the process of creating um if you're not enjoying something don't work on it um if you want to persevere with it change it you know mix things up um just give yourself leeway and um time and and space to be creative and and you don't need to force it um but just to really focus on the things that bring you joy and to do do what you love and that way you, you you're much more likely to create something that you feel proud of and that you're going to enjoy um and and none of us love the whole process all the time that's not realistic um but you know I, I really try to avoid working with fabrics I don't like or I'm just not in the mood for you know I'll just put them away and they'll come a time when they'll get used but um just find a way of of creating something um that that makes you happy that sounds like a really good plan Lucy <laughs> and then my second tip yeah is and I went through a whole bunch of cliches before I came up with this one (laughs) but my second tip is to learn and I I, obviously you know I'm a teacher that's my background and that's what I do part of what I do um but I also I'm a big advocate for learning I love I love learning myself and I think part of the reason that my projects are also different is because I like to try something new. Yeah. And great thing, particularly about quilting, is how many techniques there are. And I'm sure I've, you know, just covered just a few of them in, in the time that I've been quilting. But, you know, if you've never tried a plique, try a plique, try English paper piecing, try hand piecing, try foundation paper piecing, you know, try different methods of you know if you know you like machine piecing try somebody else's method of constructing something you know there are so many different ways of doing things and we always can be learning from each other Um, it's another reason I love the craft along because you see how people are creating things and you learn from each other so um I was um you know taught by people in my family but I was largely self-taught as well so I went on, um, you know, to learn things myself. So read blogs, watch YouTube, take classes, read books. Everybody learns in different ways. So find the way that works best for you and, and, and go for it. Step outside your comfort zone, you know, try something because you never know. You might, you know, I put off English paper piecing for a long time. I did not want to do oh, hand really? sewing. Yeah, I just didn't want to do it. I thought, who wants to do that? What a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> that quilt up in, you know, two hours on my sewing machine. Why would you spend four months, probably longer, making it, you know? Um, but then I started doing it and I was like, oh, I get it now. I get yeah. it. So well, I always yeah try something and even if you've tried it and you didn't like it maybe give it another go you know you you just you don't know um until you try something and you you don't know what you're going to find and and ask people ask the community we you know we're in such a great position right now that we have we are I know we can't see each other but we have such great contact with each other and you know if you admire somebody's work or you see them somebody's done something and you you'd love to give it a go ask them they'll tell they'll tell you you know they'll point you in the direction of the tutorial they used or whatever it may be and um we're also I know Sarah you're a great advocate for this and and supporting other people in our community and I think that's what makes it what it is is that we do all support each other and encourage each other and so don't be afraid to ask And I think that makes you feel more comfortable with taking risks because I think when it comes to learning, people can sometimes feel quite nervous, Um, you know, fear of getting it wrong, making mistakes, all that type of thing. But actually, it's now is a great time to learn because you're learning in your own home. You like you say, you've got a plethora of resources available to you. If it goes wrong, it doesn't matter. Nobody will probably see it anyway. And then you just have another go. Absolutely. Uh, And, you know, it's not even permanent it's bits of fabric and thread I mean okay if you've cut it up 
you know, but that you can probably do something else with it if, yeah. if that didn't work out the way you wanted it to, turn it into a patch. You know, that's how this whole craft began is people cutting mm. things, mending it and fixing things in different ways. And, you know, even samplers. Um, I was teaching a children's meeting for our Quaker group. I was teaching them how to cross stitch and telling them about the history of samplers and how girls would do different darning samples, you know, um, when they were at school to learn different ways of fixing their clothes and look how, pe- you know, everybody's doing that again. So mm. just you, worst case, you rip it out, you start again. Exactly. Oh, well, it's been so lovely talking to you, Lucy. I feel like you're in the room with me. Catching oh, up if I was, I'd be giving lovely. you a great big hug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and I do hope that we can see each other at some point in 2021 as well I hope so too thank you for having me thanks a lot Seth. thank you once again to my sponsor Orofil Thread for helping make this podcast possible do join us in the Facebook group Great British Quilter and sign up for the newsletter at greatbritishquilter.com to find out more and all the latest news